about, and she's been saying it the whole time, right? Teaching, testing, trusting. And then last week she made the point of the fact that the trusting is for change. It's not just teaching, testing, trusting, that's it, we win. <laughs> it's teaching, testing, trusting so that we will go with him where he wants to take us. And, you know, we're talking about, everyone who goes to church here is talking about the Holy Spirit this week, which is kind of fun. That's the first time I've liked that, <laughs> that we're on the same curriculum. And Randy and I were talking about walking in the Spirit, and I found myself thinking this morning, because I said to him, I wonder if sometimes the reason we don't walk with the Spirit is because we're not going the same place. Mm. Because we're not trying to see what he wants and where he's going. We're just going. Mm. And... That's why that teaching and testing and trusting matters so much. Because when you really trust, you try to find out where he's going. You listen to what he has to say. You look for what he has to say. You're not just like, well, if it happens, then I will. Or if this blows up, then I'll go ask. And, you know, but it's an everyday trusting. It's not the kind of trusting that comes up in an emergency. It's the kind of trusting that changes what I do in the morning to set the day in, a, in order before I get into it. It's the kind of trusting that changes what I choose, which over time changes who I am. A long, long time ago, one of our preachers said that we're not human doings, we're human beings. God isn't about what I do. He can get it done. He doesn't need me. <laughs> he likes me. He likes to use me. He gives me that blessing of opportunity to be used. But he is very interested in who I am and who I become, and that comes with trusting. So I really appreciate what Karen said last week. It really blessed me, and I look forward to hearing what she's gonna say tonight. Father, I just thank you in Jesus' name for everything mm -hmm. that you're doing. I pray that each woman who's here tonight will not leave the same as she came in. God, I know we all have our burdens, we all have our challenges, but God, I heard just this week that a, a Corey Ten Boom quote that you already knew, but I didn't, that said, God doesn't have problems. He only has plans. And God, may we know that whatever we're challenged with is a part of your plan, and we're going to be okay. That you are truly sovereign, and you are truly worthy of our trust. We love you in Jesus' name. Okay, um, you know, we uh, in this church talk a lot about, you know, our mission statement is as when disciple is sin and so sometimes there's a confusion about what it means to be a disciple that you know it's what does it actually mean a lot of people think that just because I become a Christian that makes me a disciple but that's not necessarily the case is it you know what I mean so I was thinking about this as I was preparing this lesson and I looked at the definition of what disciple is and with just a little bit of massaging I really like what I found in the dictionary and the disciple is one who embraces the teaching, models themselves after, and assists in spreading the teachings of another. Isn't that good? I mean, that's just straight up what a, a, being a disciple of Jesus is. That embraces the teaching, models themselves after, there's the change, and then doesn't stop with just how it affects me. I'm then going to assist in spreading the teaching to other people. And I really like that because... You know, most of the time when you hear the word disciple, you think about the 12 guys from the first century who followed Jesus around, and that's kind of where we stop. But that's supposed to be us as well. We're supposed to be Jesus' disciples as well. And, um, you know, all who have learned who Jesus is, who's accepted him as our Savior, the next step is to start patterning your life after him and then uh, spread the good news to others. But a lot of times Christians stop at that belief part. They think, I've I'm, I'm Christian. I know who he is. He's, a, he's my savior. Uh, but they don't move any further in that process. We sit instead of share. And so uh, and we're continuing in our study of the Gospel of Mark. And back when we were talking last, the end of last spring and through the summer with Connie and Sandy and I were deciding on what was supposed to be the focus for this year and what book we should go through, we settled on the gospel of mark primarily because it is a gospel of action that is it challenges us to see who jesus really is and then to go and do something with it not just sit there and that is we'll be changed we become that disciple and then we take what we know and impact every 
everybody that we meet in our sphere of influence with what we have learned. So we're moving on to the last quarter of our study this fall. Now we'll stop with chapter 9 and then pick up with Mark chapter 10 in, in January. But these last four lessons, I'm going to talk a lot about what it means to be a disciple. And we are going to look at some practical things that these these passages say to us about how we can encourage ourselves to be disciples, what it looks like, what it doesn't look like, and uh, we're going to find it in these passages, these last stories here in, in uh, chapters 8 and chapter 9, and then we're going to see how we can encourage and we can strengthen our commitment even when life doesn't turn out the way we really want it to sometimes. So. Uh, just to bring you up to where you are, this is our timeline again. We looked at that last week, and the great part is what's covered in the Gospel of Mark. And you notice, if you were here last week, we're up to right here where he enters Tyre and Sidon. And uh, that's where Jesus met Tyra. And if you watched last week's lesson, that's been my made-up name for uh, the woman who, who has the daughter who is um, demon-possessed. Really wonderful story if you were here last time. But we're here ending G the end of Jesus' second year of ministry. And we're about to enter the third year. And we're up to another feeding miracle. Now, most of the time when you hear... The feeding of the thousands, you think about the feeding of the 5,000 and the coupled story with Peter walking on the water. That's the one that gets the most attention in the Gospels, but just because there's a few less people at this one doesn't make it any less important. The primary difference between the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000 is in location. The feeding of the 5,000 takes place primarily in Jewish territory, and here he is in Gentile territory, and... Um, He's still in the area he was from last week, and so let's jump right in, and we'll see Mark's very uh, no-nonsense sort of uh, abbreviated style, streamlined style that he jumps right in, and he says, during those days, another large crowd gathered. Now, Matthew gets a little more information in his version of this story. He says, the great crowds came to him, bringing lame, blind, crippled, mute, and many others, and he healed them. And the people were amazed when they saw all these wonderful miracles. And then they praised the God of Israel. There is the reference to the Gentile audience. These are not followers of, of Jehovah God at this time. But once they see these great miracles, hear his teaching, they recognize that this has to come from God. Now, how different is this than the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law who saw all these miracles that Jesus was doing right in front of them, instead of saying, wow, God is at work here, they hardened their hearts and resisted him more and more and more. But these guys who were over in the, this Gentile area see these miracles, and they realize that it is a testimony to the reality of God, and they believe it was very easy for them to embrace uh, the God of Israel. So they flock to him, not just for the miracles. They don't just get get their miracles and go home. They stayed with him for three days, and um, amazing things were happening, and they didn't want to miss out on it. And so back in our Gospel of Mark, Jesus recognizes there they've been together for three days. They haven't had anything to eat, and he says, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come for a long distance. So, what do you think should have been the response of the disciples at this moment, right? They have been Jesus with Jesus for three days again. They have seen miracles and teaching and revivals right along beside the Gentiles. And now it's, this is the time to step up, catch the wave of God's movement here. And everything's happening right in front of them. And uh, remember, they also have been privy to the almost exact same miracle that happened just in the spring. This is the fall. This was back in the spring. And so, <laughs> I mean, they should say, yes, Jesus, we do need food. Should we go gather some stuff together? Do you want, what did you want us to do, Jesus? That should have been their response. But, nope, that wasn't it. Jesus, the disciples say, but where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed all these people, right? Now, this is an expression of impossibility. They're like, we can't feed these people. There's no food to feed this amount of people anywhere around. But before we kind of give the disciples a, a, a hard time here, remember now, this is us too, right? I mean, 
How many of us have seen God move in a great way, been part of something that was moving, seen God answer uh, 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 some amazing prayers or do an absolute miracle, and like two weeks later we're going, okay, but God, what about this? <laughs> and we're just like them. And so, you know, um, we have, you know, you say, well, wait a minute, they had Jesus right in front of them. They should have been different. But the, let me remind you, you have Jesus too. <laughs> you also have the Holy Spirit residing in you, which they did not have. And you also have the Word of God written in black and white. So if you forget it, you can say, oh, yeah, what did that say? So we're not as different from them as we like to think sometimes. And so we kind of gravitate toward that faithlessness in crisis moments just like they did too. So verse 5 says, we need to ask them about the loaves just like we did back in the previous miracle. And there's seven loaves this time. Does the same thing he did before, sat the crowd down, gave thanks, broke it, gave the disciples, and passed it out. They had some fish as well. And the people ate and were satisfied, and they picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. And about 4,000 men were present. That doesn't count the women and children. Could be close to 10,000 people there easily. So this is another amazing miracle that where God and through, and Jesus provides more than enough. So let's keep going in um, our study here. Verse 9 says, and then he sends the crowds away, gets in a boat with his disciple, and went to the region of Dalmathua, which we don't know where that is. Uh, but in the Mark, uh, Matthew version of this, he tells us near the, the region of Magadan, which is along the edge of the uh, Sea of Galilee. So that really is telling us we're changing locations again back. From Gentile area, he's going back into Jewish territory again. And uh, so the Pharisees and Sadducees and those who opposed Jesus didn't follow him into this area of Tyre and Sidon because we learned last week that's an unclean area and no respectable Jew would go in there because you would become unclean by simply stepping on the dirt there. And so they, but as soon as Jesus came back, there they were, waiting for him to come back to start pummeling that, him with questions and trying to trap him, which is exactly what we see. The next verse, the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus, and that word question there means to oppose. They're not asking for information. They don't want to learn anything. They're tr trying to start an argument with him, and that idea is compounded by saying they wanted to test him there. And uh, they wanted to prove his claims to be Messiah, disprove everything he said, so that gave them the right in their minds to have him executed and gotten rid of. And so, uh, the, uh, so now, then they, he asked, he said, they asked him for a sign from heaven. Now, this is not a sign given by heaven or a sign in, uh, he's asking for a sign in the heavens. And what they were asking for him to do, basically, was to do something miraculous in the celestial realm, that is, make the sun stop, make something fall from the sky, uh, send lightning, something like that, because it was a popular Jewish superstition at this time that said that demons could copy uh, uh, miracles by God on earth, kind of like, remember the story of Pharaoh's uh, in, uh, in Moses, with Moses, that he showed up in front of Pharaoh, and that the, the, his magicians could copy the, the, some of the miracles that he did. And this is where that, that comes from. But they said, they believed that only God could do the miracles in the sky. So they're asking for him to prove himself, show us who you are. If you're really God, you can do something like that. Now, where have we seen before a a, 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 a someone or asking Jesus to prove himself. All the way back in the wilderness, right? Jesus shows, yeah, uh, it was out in the wilderness for 40 days. Satan shows up and says, hey, if you're really God, turn that, those rocks into bread. Throw yourself down from the temple. Then people will know who you are. So this is kind of, the idea here is that, that the temptation is to misuse your power to prove yourself, to defend yourself, which would be sin. So this is not as overt as Satan showing up in front of him to do it, but he's using the Pharisees and Sadducees to do the same thing, to try to work through them to get him to misuse his power. So same kind of thing happening here. And so they asked for this, and then Jesus replied, 
and he sighed deeply. Now that word for sigh deeply there means groan inwardly. That he was not angry, but he was deeply grieved inside. It is a very rare word used. Only this is the only place in the New Testament that this is used, and fewer than 30 times it's used in all of Greek literature. So it's very rare, but it means that he was saddened. His heart was broken over the obvious intent and that the Pharisees continued to harden themselves in unbelief. They compared to the people in the Gentiles, how they responded to what was going on versus what they were doing. Their hearts were hard and hardened, and Jesus was, was disturbed by this. And that's important to remember as we go on in this story and see the conversation we're going to have. But remember that this is his mental state. This is his, what's going on in his heart as he's thinking about this conversation here. And so he says, why does this generation ask for a miraculous sign? Better word than ask in some translation is seek. That is continually asking over and over. Not just one time. This is not just a question. He's, he is, they're saying, say, why do you just keep asking the same thing over and over and over again? Now, Jesus, this is sort of a rebuke by Jesus here. And not just, he's not just asking them a question. He is, he is upset by the apostate religious leaders who should have known what the word of God is, should have recognized what was going on, but didn't. And but he also directs it beyond them to the entire generation that is going on. He goes on to say, I'll tell you the truth. No sign will be given to it. And uh, Matthew adds in this that no sign will be given but the sign of Jonah, which is a reference to his death, burial, and resurrection that's to come. So then he left them, got back in the boat, across to the other side, another scene change here. And so, but the issue of bread is still on the table, so to speak, uh, because he's going to pick back up with bread in verses 14 and following here. Now, remember the context here. Keep that in mind. The disciples had just witnessed this striking conversation and this confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees here. And this should be have more going on in their mind than what they're going to talk about here, which is they had forgotten to bring bread except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. So, um, now, and so they're, they're worried about what to eat. Now, don't you, don't you want Peter just to go, hey, we got one loaf. That's enough. Let's just give it to Jesus. Don't you just want him to say that? <laughs> That's not what happens here. Yeah, and so Jesus still breathed in his spirit, thinking about what's going on with the, the, these religious leaders here and, and um, how they were supposed to be students of the word of God and with this, this encounter barely over. Um, he, he turns to his closest friends and he looks at them and he's like, I'm going to give you this important teaching here. Now y'all pay attention. And he says, be careful. Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. Now we know who the Pharisees are. Uh, this reference to Herod could be one of two things. Most commentators said it could be talking about the Herodians, which we've already met before, which the Pharisees are conspiring with to try to get rid of Jesus. Or if it is about King Herod, then it would probably be a warning about being drawn away by the world and its priorities. So, but he gives them two commands here. Be careful and watch out. That is, uh, he's like, really pay attention here. And he, that indicates the seriousness of what Jesus is saying. It's like, use your brain. Be discerning here. Don't be taken in. That's kind of what he's saying here. He says, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. Now, yeast is leavening like we have today but they didn't have it in little powder packets like we have today the way it, when bread was be, about to be made back then what they would do is before they would shape it they would pull off a piece of it put it in water for it to ferment and they would make the bread and bake it and the next time they wanted to make it they'd take that fermented water and dough pour it into the new batch and that would make it rise that's how they kept their their um their uh, their yeast you know for eating Continually. So, now leavening in the New Testament, or in the Old Testament, all out through Scripture, really refers to permeating power or influence, mostly used in, in, in reference to sin or evil. Um, and, of course, here in context, he's talking about the evil of the Pharisees, their teachings, and Herod's 
and, and or the Herodians in this present passage. So the disciples don't latch on to what Jesus is talking about at all. They're all focused over here on bread. And so they turn to each other after this, this, and they start talking among themselves and say, he said that because there's no bread. And you're going, no, <laughs> no, that's not it. They're so distracted once again, and they don't know what he's saying, and they don't go to him and say, can you explain that? Or anything like they've done before, they just start, you know, coming up with these ideas on themselves. Uh, and, um, and notice how they inject fear into the discussion, right? Is it true that they don't have any bread? No. no, they have one loaf, presumably right in front of them, right? And now this wasn't a big loaf, it would have been small, it would have been enough for them to break off and have a bite at least. And so now again, this is us, right? Let's don't give them a hard time too much because don't, don't we go to church? Don't we talk, have stirring conversations with other people, read a book? You know, you know that the Holy Spirit is working. You feel him talking to you, leading in you some direction. And then you get in the car to go home, and you're distracted by the traffic. Or I need to stop and get gas. Or, more literally, you start talking about what we're going to have for lunch. Right? <laughs> I mean, don't we do that? And in five seconds, we have forgotten what God is saying to us. This is us, right? And so this is an example of a parable of the sower and the weeds, right? <laughs> the, the, the attention we give to temporary concerns snatches out and chokes away what God is trying to do in our hearts. So when Jesus gets a little bit exasperated with them here, and he calls them out a little bit, he says, aware of their discussion, Jesus said, why are you talking about having no bread? Don't you see and understand? Are your hearts hardened too? Don't you have, do you have eyes that fail to see, ears that fail to hear? Don't you remember? And so he goes on next and goes through the two miracles of providing uh, bread for the masses in verses 19 to 21. He goes back through the five, feeding of the 5,000 and then the feeding of the 4,000. And he gets to the end and he says, don't you understand? Now Mark leaves is hanging there. He doesn't he doesn't tell us what the disciple, how the disciples re uh, respond, but Matthew does tell us. They finally got it because Matthew tells us, then they understood he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so, yes, finally, they are up to speed on what Jesus is trying to say. Now, that's as far as we're going to go with the passages in, in, in scriptures tonight, but... Remember that it's very easy for us to stand way over here on the other side of the cross and, uh, and with the inside of the Apostle Paul and 2,000 years of teaching, 2,000 years of commentaries, 2,000 years of sermons, and, and so much more. It's very easy for us to go, how could they be so dull? How could they be so dull? I mean, I would have remembered. I would have had faith if I had been there. But the thing to see in this section is not... Uh, how that we would be better than they would be, because that's really not true, because they're just examples of all of us. But the thing to see is this huge warning to us today. That is, I mean, they followed along behind Jesus. They saw him in flesh and blood. They saw him do miraculous things right in front of their, his, their eyes. Multiple times in the gospel, there's verses that tell us, just like today's, that said they saw the blind heal, the lame walk, uh, and all of that. And there are a lot of more miracles that are not included in, in the scriptures. And there's a lot of conversations that they had with Jesus that are not included for us. They heard him preach. They got the sidebar teachings over here. And even with all of that, they still struggle to understand. And so instead of us going, wow, those are some dumb disciples, right? Instead of doing that, we need to be aware of how easy it is for truth to escape us. And how, it is, how easy it is for us to miss things in a time when we don't have Jesus right here in front of us. And how easy it is for those connections just to be lost if we're not paying attention to that still small voice of God gently guiding us and gently leading us. So what's the takeaway from this section of Mark? Let me give you a few things I see that help you going to stay sharp. Now, I'm going to couch this as in... Uh, the school of discipleship, because actual school is a lot like sometimes um, 
what we do in learning to be a disciple. And, and these are very similar things that we can do like uh, we would do in a classroom. So the first thing is listen to your teacher. Listen to your teacher. I mean, this is the biggest reason that the disciples, I think, I mentioned this a minute ago, is that the Holy Spirit as a resident in their hearts was not present yet. So uh, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would come after he ascended in back into heaven and that he, then he would reside in us forever. And that's what our promise, they didn't have it yet. It didn't come, come to Pentecost. So and one of the, there's one verse that gives us some idea of what the functions of, a function of the Holy Spirit is, and that's John 14, 26, where it says, The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have said to you. So this isn't just remembering, like uh, I'm going to remember to take my lunch to work or remember somebody's birthday. It's a different kind of remember, remembering. That is remembering with understanding. Remembering with understanding or being taught with understanding. That's that, aha, okay, I got it. That I've made the connection and I understand what you're trying to say to me. That's the work of the Holy Spirit that they did not have yet. But we do. If you're a believer in Jesus, you have a personal teacher who is with you. And according to this verse, he has two jobs. Now, he has a lot of jobs, but two in this verse is the first is that I'll teach you all things. Teach you all things. Now, this means that I don't understand what the Bible says is not a valid excuse for not reading I just can't understand what that's saying. I just don't know. Not a valid excuse because he made a personal promise that he will teach you all things. But we have a part in that, right? We have a part in that. He's just not going to drop knowledge into your head no more than a teacher's going to drop knowledge into your head in a regular classroom. That you know you can't be taught if you don't show up for class. You don't do the reading. You don't take the test. There is homework involved in learning what God is teaching us. We have to be willing to hear what he says. So ask for understanding. Ask. When you read the Bible, God, I don't understand that. Can you teach me? That's his promise, okay? And then look for the answer. Might not be immediately. It might be if that comes through with the, the words of a friend or uh, some teaching on a Sunday morning, or a book you read, but look for the answers. And um, so you don't learn algebra overnight, do you? Incremental learning, one step at a time. One, you know, lots of practice, we talked about that before, lots of practice sheets, lots of worksheets, lots of over and over and over again. You might need to do some more studying and thinking. And sometimes you need to strain to learn some hard things, right? You need to work at it. God says he'll teach you and he's not going to force you pray ask work at it a little sometimes work at it a lot and then the other thing it says in here he'll remind you of everything that I said to you now what is necessary first in order to be reminded of something you have to know it right you have to know it you can't be reminded of something that you don't know so if the Holy Spirit is going to be able to remind you of all things, what Jesus said, then you must already know some of the things that Jesus said. Psalm 119 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's what we need to do in order to facilitate, facilitate the Holy Spirit being able to remind us of things. And that, that is when we face a crisis. When we face temptation or we have to make a hard decision or somebody just walks up to you and asks a question. If we, need to be, if we want to be reminded of it, it's got to be in there somewhere. So, again, read, study, apply. Remember, God doesn't just give us information for information's sake. He is molding us and shaping us and conforming us. So we don't have to try to figure out everything immediately. But Jesus said if we want to really know Holy Spirit will teach us and then help us remember it when we need it. So, imperative that we study and learn for the purpose of application, for the purpose of bringing our lives into conformity and submission and obedience to what he says. Not just learning Bible sets facts. 1 Corinthians says, knowledge by itself puffs up. Man
makes you more prideful. It's not going to help you with being a disciple and you're just gaining knowledge so you'll be smart in Bible class or just make you feel good. It's for the purpose of you conforming your life to it. And then, so we've got to listen to your teacher and then take some notes, right? You have to take notes in class, you're going to learn something, right? Now, I am a huge advocate of journaling. Now, I'm, I gravitate in that direction because I am kind of a writer. But I, even if it feels awkward and stiff to you, you need to learn to write some things down. It doesn't have to be on, 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 uh, in a notebook with a pencil. It can be on your uh, a note-taking app. It can be on your computer, whatever way works best for you. All kinds of good things. To, uh, that there are tools out there. You think, well, you know, I'm just not a writer. I just don't like writing all that stuff down. I don't know what I would say. But you need to write some stuff down, not to share with anybody, but just for you. Uh, now, let me say three things about uh, why this is important, I believe, is that the first is that you provide yourself a written record of God's faithfulness to you. Now, the Bible is uh, uh, his written record of faithfulness to all of us, but your journal becomes a private, personal record of his faithfulness to you. Now, things in your life are built up and torn down really slowly, right? Erosion is a slow, slow process, and we often don't take notice, right? We just go on with life, and things happen, and you don't pay attention. But if you journal, you begin to see patterns and trends. They emerge. Journaling helps you make be aware of God's work in your life over the long haul, not just this week or last week, but over a long haul long time. Uh, and if you read the Old Testament, God's interaction with Israel, you see these words have, show up all the time, and they are, and Israel forgot. And Israel didn't remember. Right? You see that over and over and over and over again. See, forgetfulness is one of Satan's key tools in your life. Now, you think, well, you know, I just don't have a good memory, and I'm not sharp, and blah, 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 and all of that. But it's, if you're a believer, it's more than that. You have a spiritual enemy who is actively working to steal spiritual things from you. It is not inert. It is working against you. Remember the parable of sower again? The seeds cast upon the path. Jesus tells us there that Satan is the one who steals the word from us. And so writing down your thoughts, writing your insights, the things God does in your life, your prayers, is key to hanging on to those things. And to use the analogy of the sower a little more, if that's how we dig up the dirt so the seeds go down in the soil and take root, begin to grow. So, written record of God's faithfulness, then you can come to a place of uncensored honesty with God. I mean, you can mull things around in your head and allow yourself to become convinced of all kinds of things that are against the written word of God. You know how you get to go on and on and on in your head and you're having this argument with somebody over here and suddenly you're coming up with all these things that you know are not the will of God. But So is it, if it's up in your head, you can convince yourself, right? <laughs> but when you write your thoughts down and you put them on paper, Boy, you see them in black and white, uh, that black pen on white paper, and it can be starkly, you know, honest sometimes. It can be, it reminds you that it, these things are really shocking, that they shouldn't be part of the way you're thinking, the way you're acting. I have a friend, and we were in a Bible study, and we were talking about journaling, this is some time ago, but she did what was called free flow, free flow journaling. That is, you read a passage of scripture, you think about it, and then you just write whatever comes to your mind. That's just the way she did it. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, you know, whatever comes up goes on the paper. And so she was had been thinking about a very difficult situation that she had in, uh, with a, a work, a coworker. And this was just really bad. It was, I mean, like really bad, almost a point of abuse, she would say. But so she was sitting there thinking about it, and what came to her mind were these words. Uh, um, and she said that, that I hate you, and I want you to die a painful, horrible death. And she said she was shocked by that. She's like, I don't want to write that down. And, but she was like, because that's the way she did it. She said she wrote it down, and then she went on, and then she came back a few days later, 
through her journaling again, and the same thought came to her mind, so she wrote it down again, and she stopped, and she thought about it, and she asked now, Lord, I, I, don't, I, I don't want them to die, I don't want her, her to die, but help me with this, and through prayer, through that journaling, through writing this, being really honest with God, what God showed her was, because you are unforgiving, you are the one dying a painful, horrible death. Wow. <laughs> right? Wow. I mean, but if she keeps this up in her head or she dismisses it, she never gets to the point where God is calling her to work through forgiveness, which is what she did as a result of that, and to forgive and to move on in that relationship. And I thought, I thought that is what happens when we are honest in our journaling. And so now... If you don't have the courage to write things down, don't have courage to say, God, help me see what's here, then we miss things that God wants to show us and move us toward following him and being conformed to his likeness. And the last thing here, we know it gives us clarity. It gives us clarity. Now, if you grew up in my age, do you know what this camera is? It's a Polaroid SX-70, right? My dad bought this. He was a first adopter way back in the... 60s. He loved new stuff, and so he brought this thing home, and this was so exciting. This was the first instant Polaroid camera, and you push that little red button right there, and remember the little thing had that noise, that, and it came out, and it, 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 and it didn't have a picture to begin with. Y'all remember that? If not, then just bear with me. It was kind of, uh, uh, it was white, and so you're just looking at it, and you have to, and we would gather around the table, right? We would peer over this thing and wait for the image to appear, right? We're just like looking at it going, well, I guess we didn't have technology back then, so we were easily entertained. <laughs> but, but so this is what journaling does to you, right? For you. It, something catches your attention, an event of the day, a quote, a conversation you have, a news story, certainly scripture or prayer, or you're working through an emotional time or whatever. And as we reflect on what we saw, heard, did, whatever, it's like looking at that picture, right? We see the image of what's going on really start to emerge and it develops before our eyes. Through journaling, we can get behind whatever the event is that's on the surface and start helping, and God helps us to see what's deeper there. And um, so uh, this is why we gave you these books that has the scripture and the white pages on the other side of it. And this is not necessarily for you to write down what I say or what your, uh, your table leader says, but this is for you to read the scripture and you to write down what you hear God saying to you as you read through the gospel of Mark. Because he's going to say something different to you than he does to me or your table leaders or anybody else. So highlight words, circle phrases. Ask God to be your teacher to show you what's in there. Or work through those questions that we do. Write it out there and hey, begin to make a written record of what God is doing in your life. Um, when you put your pen to paper, it helps you work through things at a deeper level. And sharpens, you become sharper and not duller. Okay, so we then take notes and we're going to access our resources. Every teacher has stuff that you can uh, come and help to learn your, your lessons, right? Back when I was in school, it was go to the library, it was encyclopedias, they had the internet, and that kind of stuff. But our perspective, as we look at something happening in our lives, the more we look at it, the more we talk about it, the more we think about it, the more we angst over it, the bigger it becomes in our life, in our vision. It's the only thing we can think about it. And emotions swell around it, and it just, it, it, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, the crisis just balloons, and it gets so big sometimes it blocks out our vision of God, right? And so what, what we do is we need to stop looking at the things so much and start looking at God. And we need to look at who he is and then see whatever crisis, whatever thing that we're dealing with in comparison to our great God. And as we elevate him in our mind, he gets bigger. Not that this goes away, but in comparison now, it's not so big. God is what's big. Remember uh, the disciples in the boat? They got the piece of bread there. They could have said, hey, it's a small piece of bread, but we have a really big God. We have a really big Jesus that he's just fed 10,000 people with, with seven loaves of he can feed us with one, you know, but if our attention is on the thing that's bothering us, then 
we're tempted to believe that it is bigger than God and that maybe my thing is too big for God to provide. But God, as we know, the scripture tells us, he is the creator of all things. He spoke everything into existence and he could have just, Jesus could have just as easily just dropped food down out of the sky, but he didn't do that, right? He, he, we don't tax God's ability when we ask him to do stuff for us. Regardless of what the need is. Now, of course, that doesn't mean we get everything that we want the way we want it, right? We struggle with that. But James tells us sometimes it's because we ask for the wrong motives, right? And we learn lots of things by coming up right to the edge of need and waiting for God to provide. Waiting teaches us lots and lots of valuable lessons. And there's lots of reasons that things might take longer or it might not end up being the way we want it to be. God has infinite resources. We don't tax them when we ask for him to help us. And remember that um, journaling helps us to see how he's provided for us in the past, right? And then our ability to trust him grows more and more for next time and next time and the next time. And the last thing we'll talk about tonight is that you need to join in. And we talked about this a little bit last time in the feeding of the 5,000. Um, anybody plays a sport in high school or college? Or in um, maybe rec league as an adult, anybody? Well, <laughs> if you, it, what happens if you don't use those skills? They go away, right? <laughs> you just don't, they become dull. You don't have the reflexes, you don't respond to the ball as well. You just lose your edge. If you're not doing anything with the skills that you have, you lose that edge. Same is true for Christians. We don't get involved in what God's doing in his kingdom here on earth. Our skills become dull as well. We don't respond to him like we should. We don't respond the way we should in situations. And, you know, remember that the disciples are standing there looking at Jesus, wondering what to do about all these people here. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't turn those rocks into bread, right? He chooses to involve the disciples in meeting the needs. He told them to go gather stuff. He told them to help them sit down. He told them to distribute the food. And for us today, we have to remember that God can do the work without us. He doesn't need our help, but you know what? He invites us to be a part of it. Even when we are slow to follow, when, when we are dull in our understanding, just like the disciples. My husband, Cliff, he says that God gets his work done not because of us, but in spite of us. Because sometimes we get in the way, right? I mean, but he's still, even, even though we do sometimes make it take longer, um, you know, he still invites us. Jesus could have told his disciples, just stand back, watch, I'll do it, let me do something, bam, and that happens, but he doesn't. In his compassion toward them, he allowed them to be a part of the process. So, pattern continues today. In his infinite wisdom, mercy, and grace, God chooses to allow us to be part of his divine work of carrying the gospel to those who don't know him. It is an expression of his compassion and his love to other people, and he works that through our lives. This is an immense privilege. I mean, remember back when you were in school, right, when the teacher would say, hey, I want you to come help me out with this. You felt like, oh, I'm really special, but the teacher wants me. You know, it was dust erasers back, back when, <laughs> or you know, clean, out the, clean out the chalkboard or whatever. But uh, imagine if we thought about how privileged we are to be invited by God to help him do work, you know? is much more of a privilege and an honor that, and, and that, than anything that happened in school, and we should great, embrace it and be grateful for it. He's not trying to make you do something terrible. He's welcoming you to join in his kingdom work. Doesn't that change the way you think about it? Okay, and remember, submissively serving him in his name and his power right now prepares us to serve him in the next life for all eternity in ways we can never, ever imagine. Amen? Mm -hmm. God, we just thank you that you love us so much that uh, you want us to be your disciples who can uh, respond to our teachers and, and we can lean into you and that we can count it a privilege to do whatever you call us to do. God, give us new eyes to see 
Give us a desire to follow you, a desire to do what you've called us to do with joy and with peace and with excitement and that we would be called your children forever and ever and ever. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.